John chapter 21 is where we're going to go back and look at now. I've titled this message, Loving Jesus, because I really believe that's what it's all about. You know, in many books, there is what is called a prologue and an epilogue. The prologue is actually an introductory preview at the beginning of the book regarding the main subject. The epilogue in a, uh, in a book is really a short addition, a concluding section at the end of the book, and it often deals with the future of the main characters in the book. Well, John chapter 21 is an epilogue. It, it is precisely that. And it begins with pointing out seven of the original 12 disciples. One, of course, is by this time deceased, Judas Iscariot. But there is a central character among these seven disciples that stands out in this chapter, and we all know who that is. That's Peter. This chapter gives extreme important insight from our Lord about what it means to know him, to walk with him, and specifically to serve him or to minister for him. That involves, of course, reaching people and uh, training others. And he uses a wonderful illustration to begin with, fishing. I don't know about you. You may not like fishing. Some people like fishing, some don't. The only time I like fishing is when I'm catching fish. If I'm standing around not catching fish, I don't like fishing. But uh, I don't mind it. Jesus uses fishing because these men that he is dealing with were formerly professional fishermen. Perhaps all seven of them were. I don't know. But I do know that uh, a bunch of them were fishermen. This, we are told in the 21st chapter, is the third time that Jesus shows himself after his resurrection to his disciples, specifically. Two times, we saw it last week in chapter 20. This is the third time that he reveals himself to these disciples. But he had told them, even prior to his crucifixion, look, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer there. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again the third day, and I want you to meet me in the Galilee. And so with that pre previous instruction, here are these guys. They're in the Galilee. And in fact, in verse 1, they're in a very specific place. They're at what we would call today the Sea of Galilee. Here in that verse 1, it's called the Sea of Tiberias. And the reason it's called that is because the son of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, he built this city in about 20 AD in honor of the Roman emperor Tiberius Caesar. And so this time, it's only a decade or more since that city had actually been built. It's a, a very uh, recent city that this sea here is named after. And so I want to look at the, the first encounter that they have here with Jesus in the Galilee at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, but before we do so, let's take a moment and once again pray, shall we? Th thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for bringing us here today. Uh, this is the best place that we could be. This is the place, Lord, that you want us to gather together with an open Bible, and we want to hear, and you want us to hear from you, and we do. We want to hear from you. We want you to teach us, Lord. Teach us what it means to really love Jesus. Give us insight regarding this. And I pray that you would stir once again a fresh love in our hearts. Stir it up in us today as we think about this important subject because of who you are. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Fishing. That's what they're doing. In fact, verse 2 says, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas, that's two, called Didymus, which means 
the twin. He had a twin brother, evidently. And Nathaniel, that's three. Nathaniel of Cana. So we remember Jesus performed his first sign miracle of turning that water into wine. Nathaniel. And then the sons of Zebedee, and we know who they are. James and John. And so you have uh, a number of these disciples. Then it says two others. So you have five and then two other disciples. Seven of the original 12 disciples are here in this uh, chapter. Two of these disciples are unnamed. I don't know why they're unnamed. I would suppose that perhaps one of the two that are unnamed is Andy, uh, Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, probably him. Uh, also, the other one, uh, I have a big question mark in my mind as to who that might be. Could take a guess, but that doesn't even matter. What's important for us to see here is that Peter, of course, is the natural leader of the group of seven. And uh, he's the one that proposes this whole idea. Verse three, Simon Peter says to them, to the other six, I'm going fishing. And they say to him, well, we'll go with you. And so they went forth, they entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Look at the participation here of these seven as they decide to follow Peter and go back to fishing. When Peter went fishing, I don't think that at this point in his experience, he was simply doing it for the fun of it, that he was just, uh, he missed it, and he was just, going to take a little time and, and a little fishing trip. No, I really believe that Peter was a terribly discouraged disciple. I believe that uh, Peter went fishing because he was so discouraged, even though the Lord had already met with him and had forgiven him, I think that he felt useless I think that he had uh, that sense that, you know what, I'm not fit for being a follower and uh, a, a servant of Jesus the Messiah. And so I believe that that's the impetus that led him back to fishing. He went back to his previous life. I think he felt like he had bombed out, as we might say. And perhaps the other guys that joined him, the other six, maybe they felt pretty much the same way. And then they go back to what they were professionals at. Peter was a professional fisherman, and yet didn't catch a thing the whole night. Nothing. That's what we get when we look at uh, that third verse. Look at the situation here. Peter not only failed in being a true follower of the Lord, but now he's failing at his former profession. Now he's failing as a fisherman. And I think that Jesus is in his failure. I really believe that Jesus uses our failures at times to teach us and to uh, make it a, a teachable moment. And I think the lesson here is that, look, if you are ignoring Jesus, you're going to suffer failure. It doesn't matter what accolades you might get from others. You are a failure without Jesus. I'm a failure without him. And this is the lesson I think that the Lord is teaching him and these other disciples. He is in our failures. Don't make any mistake about it. When things are very discouraging, God wants to use those discouraging times. He wants to teach us that without him, our labor is in vain. But then look, Jesus, he comes to them that morning. He stood on the shore, verse 4, and the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Perhaps it was the distance. They were about uh, uh, 300 yards away. but. Uh, they didn't know it was Jesus, and so he shouts to them across the water, literally, boys, you don't have anything to eat, do you? That's really what verse 5 means. And, of course, he's expecting 
the answer that they give him, no. And then he says in verse 6, well, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you'll find. No. There's nothing magic about the right side of the ship. I'm sure they had cast the net on the right side all night and the left side many times. What's Jesus doing here? He is teaching them dependent obedience. That's what he's teaching us. He's teaching us that if we will depend upon him and obey him, something's going to happen. He's teaching them to depend upon him when and where he's leading them to fish. This whole incident, look at what happens as a result in verse 6. They cast their four, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Without Jesus, failure. With Jesus, success. Well, that's a great lesson to learn. Hopefully, we learn that early on in our Christian experience. That with Jesus, their success, regardless of how the world pictures it and paints success, with Jesus, their success, if you will depend upon him and take those steps of obedience, you're going to see God doing something. Now, this whole situation must have reminded these disciples of what took place in Luke chapter 5. There was a similar experience when Jesus gets into the boat with them and says, launch out into the deep, let down your, your nets for a catch of fish. And they had been fishing the, the, that night before and caught nothing. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't time to fish during the day. They did it during, and they obeyed God. And when they did, they caught such a great uh, catch of fish. Luke tells us that the net began to break. And they were all amazed. You remember Peter, especially. We are told that uh, Peter falls down in that boat at the feet of Jesus. And he says, Lord, depart from me. I'm not even worthy to be in your presence. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. That must have brought back memories when this incident happened, as we read about in the sixth verse of John 21, Luke 5 came to mind. And basically the lesson is this, look, if you obey me, you're going to catch fish. If you obey me, you're going to be successful. In fact, in this instance, it says that uh, the net didn't even break, and yet it was full of fish. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up, he drew the net full of great fish, 153 to be exact, big ones, large ones, all keepers. I'm not going to get into um, uh, Gematra or anything that has to do with the number here, but there were so many, and yet the net was not broken. In other words, here you go. If you'll follow me in dependent obedience, I'll make you successful. Not one fish would be lost. Now, in that lesson... In Luke chapter 5, when Peter fell down before the Lord and said what he did, you know what Jesus did? He said, Peter, don't worry. Fear not. He said, from henceforth, from now on, you're going to catch men, not fish. You're going to catch men. And literally, you will catch men alive. Just the opposite of what happened when you catch fish. When you catch fish, you take them out of their realm of life into the realm of death. But when you catch men, you take them out of the realm of death for men and women and people are dead in sin, and you bring them into the realm of life. So you catch men alive. This is the lesson here, and not one of them will be lost. You see, when Jesus saves, he saves you for eternity. Not one will be lost. You'll catch men alive, and they will be alive forevermore. That's the first wonderful illustration. Now he's going to uh, talk about another aspect, not merely catching men alive, not merely bringing men to faith in Jesus, but now the job doesn't end there. Now he switches the metaphor from fishing to feeding. Look at how it goes. In verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. 
when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he jumped out of the boat. Uh, and verse 8, other disciples came in a little ship. He swam. He didn't worry about uh, coming by boat. Uh, they weren't far from land, but uh, 200 cubits, as I said, th about 300 yards, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they came to land, look at what they saw, a fire of coals and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring the fish which you've now caught. Peter does it. Verse 12, and Jesus says, come and dine. In chapter 1, he says to the disciples that are following him, that are curious about him, that haven't really joined him yet, come and see. They wondered, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Come and see. Here he says, come and dine. And none of them durst, uh, of the disciples, uh, durst ask him, who art thou, knowing it was the Lord? Now, I don't understand all of that, but perhaps Jesus' resurrection, post-resurrection appearance, uh, he looked uh, different uh, than he did prior to. I'm not sure, but they knew it was the Lord. That was verifiable to them. And verse 13, Jesus then cometh. He takes bread. He gives them fish likewise. This is now the third time that he showed himself to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of Jonas, Simon Johnson, <laughs> Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And then Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. Yes. And he says, feed my lambs. He asks them again. And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He says, feed my sheep. You know, the difference between a lamb and a sheep, right? A lamb is a young sheep. A sheep is a mature sheep. Uh, a lamb that has matured. And then verse 17, third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was really grieved because it was the third time that he asked, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is about feeding. Jesus uh, really creates uh, this setting in order to personally connect with his followers, with his disciples. This is a meeting that will prepare these men for useful ministry, for useful service to the Lord. And the first thing he does, of course, is make this a visitation. He visits them. Boys, you don't have anything to eat now, do you? Very revealing question. And... Uh, it must have been convicting as well. No, they had to own their own failure. But I should say this. You read this and you just know how God works with people generally. And you realize that failure is not the last chapter. Failure is never final. It doesn't have to be. If failure is final in our lives, it's because we made it that. It's not because God has said, okay, you messed up. That's it. I'm done with you. He doesn't, he doesn't work that way. We work that way, but he doesn't. Visitation. He visits them. And then that is followed by provision. And I want you to see the provision here. Uh, there are actually two parts in this uh, meeting that Jesus sets up. And in doing this, he meets their needs. He gives them fish in their net, so great that they can that it can hardly be dragged in, full of big fish. And then he makes them breakfast. They get to shore, and he already has fish and bread baking on a fire of coals. What's Jesus doing in giving provision? He is actually drawing these men to himself by serving them in this way, by providing for them in this way. And Peter, when he finds out it's the Lord, when John identifies that, that, uh, that person on the shore, that's Jesus, Peter is anxious to get to Jesus. He doesn't care. He jumps in the water. He swims to shore. He's tired, obviously, when he gets there. He's wet and he's cold and hungry. 
but I have to admire his anxiousness to get to Jesus. And I hope that that really characterizes our attitude toward the Lord, that we, like Peter, aren't going to put it off. We're not going to wait. We, like Peter, are anxious to get into the presence of the Lord. We're anxious to connect with the Lord. This is what Jesus is doing here in this provision. He's drawing these men to himself by meeting all of their physical necessities at the moment. But why is he drawing them to himself? Because he wants to develop them. He draws to develop. He wants to develop their love for him. He wants to develop their ability to follow him. And so he's developing them for relationship. He's drawing them to develop a relationship with them that's deeper so that they can then serve and minister properly. He's drawing them. He's inviting them into partnership with himself. He's directing them and teaching them to depend upon his ability to accomplish whatever it is that uh, he desires them to accomplish. And so he gives Peter, you might say, this reinstatement here. Remember, we're told in the Gospels that after Peter denied the Lord, that the Lord specifically gave direction to the women, go tell Peter too. Go tell the disciples, but tell Peter too, because he knew Peter was going to get, he's really going to be bummed out, really going to hit the bottom. Go tell Peter too. And then we are told in the book of 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus had a singular meeting with Peter. He met him one-on-one. -on -one. So Peter had already had uh, his uh, denial forgiven, but he still probably felt uh, really useless to the Lord, as I said earlier. What happens beginning in verse 15? He combines this thing of feeding with following. And here now, Jesus has moved from addressing their physical needs, gave them fish, breakfast, to now dealing with their spiritual needs. This, uh, again, Peter was already restored. Now Peter is being recommissioned for serving the Lord, for ministry. And the one big question that has to be answered, if anyone is going to properly serve the Lord and follow him. The one big question is what Jesus asks him three times in verses 15 to 17, and it's simply this, Peter, do you love me? That is the credential for following and serving the Lord. You don't ever have to darken the door of a Bible college in order to serve and follow the Lord. You don't have to have a, a, a particular skill set in order to follow and serve the Lord. The credential is, Peter, do you love me? And that's the question that is asked to us as well. That is the basis for serving God. That is the basis for following the Lord. Do you love the Lord? Now, we can say it, we can sing it, and, it, it, and we do it without thinking, but I want you to think this morning, and I want you to really answer that in your heart of hearts. What Jesus asked Peter, ask yourself, do I love the Lord? Do I really love him? What he's calling for here is your devotion. Your love for Jesus has to be supreme in your life. There can't be anything or anyone else that you love more than the Lord. This is what's on the line here. What is your greatest love when Jesus says three times, Peter, lovest thou me? What's your greatest love in life? Because any service for the Lord has to be love compelled. The key to serving, the key to ministering is not because people pump you up or, or people slap you on the back and applaud you for your ministry, it's got to be, I love Jesus. 
I'm doing this because I love him. It's simply the overflow, the passionate, fervent overflow of a love relationship with my Lord. And if Jesus gets your love, he gets everything. And that's why that is supreme. He wants our love genuinely because if he has that, he has everything that pertains to you. And until he has that love, there is a distance between you and him. He wants devotion. And that's why he asked Peter three times like this. And I am certain that it also has to do with the fact that Peter denied the Lord three times. Peter failed. He messed up. He was inconsistent. He was sinful. And yet God wasn't through with him. He was still going to be useful to the Lord, and we know that. We have two letters in our New Testament that after this event was written by Peter. And Jesus predicted that he would fall, that he would deny the Lord, and he warned him. He said, Peter, I just want to warn you, caution, Satan is after you. He wants to sift you like wheat. Then he said, but when you're converted, he didn't mean saved. Peter was already saved. What he meant by that is, when you are turned back and no longer deny me, when you turn back to me, strengthen my brethren. Strengthen your brethren. And that's exactly what happens in this man's life. But here we see Jesus putting him in a place of of really supervision over other believers. God uh, God's not through with Peter. The Lord is so patient with us, isn't he? Here he reinstates Peter for ministry. He says, uh, feed my lambs. He says, feed my sheep. He says, feed my sheep. And what he means by that is tend God's people, take care of God's people, lead God's people into spiritual pasture. Three times he denied, three times Jesus reinstates him. Feed, feed, tend, care. The love for Jesus that Peter said he had, you know how it's going to be shown? You know how it's going to be proven? It's going to be proven by him sacrificially serving other people. It's, it, he's going to prove that he loves Jesus by loving them. Notice how it says, uh, how the Lord uh, says this, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, God's people. They're his people, they're not mine. They're not yours. They're God's people. And the privilege is that we get to be a part of ministering to the people of God. And that proves our love. When we invest our lives in impacting Jesus' people, instead of expecting others to help us, we help them. We minister to others. We prove our love for the Lord. But notice, we're never, we're never ready to serve the Lord until, first of all, we have allowed the Lord to minister to us. We can't minister to others. Jesus ministered to Peter, and then Peter had from that ministry to the Lord's people. That's the order. Until our hearts have been touched, until we have been ministered to by the Lord, we're not fit to minister to other people. We're not ready, at least, following him. And then, as it goes on, and, and by the way, I should at least acknowledge the fact that when the Lord uh, says, lovest thou me in verses 15 and 16, he uses that word agape, agapao. And then Peter, when he answers the Lord, he uses a different word. He uses the word phileo, which is a word uh, that it's, it's a good word. It's a word for love. And I don't, I don't want to make a big deal about the different uses of the words here because I think I don't, I, I don't want to detract from what's being said here. I really believe that Peter loved the Lord. 
just as I, when you say you love the Lord, I, I take it at face value. I believe that, but it has to go deeper. And the Lord is leading him to go deeper in his love for the Lord. And here's what he says to him. If you follow uh, the whole section, look at verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when you are young, you dressed yourself, you girded yourself, you walked where, where you wanted to walk, you went where you wanted to go. But when you're, when you're going to be old, you're going to stretch forth your hands and another will dress you and will carry you where you don't want to go. What's he talking about? Well, he tells us in the next verse. This Jesus meant to signify by what death he should glorify God. He was predicting the fact that Peter would die a martyr's death. We don't have that actually recorded in the Bible. We just have tradition that tells us that Peter was crucified. But he refused to be crucified like his Lord, and he asked to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified right side up like his Lord. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know it's true that he died a martyr's death. And Jesus is predicting that here. This is about dedication, devotion, but this is dedication. Devotion, do you love me? Dedication, will you do my will, even if it involves death? Oh, and by the way, everyone has to face this issue of death, not simply because we die physically, but you can't serve the Lord until you are willing to die to yourself, until you are willing to die to selfish ambition, to selfish motives, to doing whatever you would do for the Lord, uh, 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 for the, the praise of men. There has to be a willingness to give up your ambitions, your personal desires, and find out what does God want me to do with my life? And when you discover that, you do it. That's what he's talking about here. You have to face this issue of death, whether it be whether it be in that spiritual sense of dying to self or the actual physical giving of yourself to dedicate yourself to the Lord. It says to him, follow me. Simple, two words, verse 19, follow me. After he tells him you're going to die doing so, but follow me. Dedicate your loyalty, continual loyalty. When, you're, when your ministry, when your service for the Lord, when you're walking with the Lord, is love compelled? It's going to be loyal. It's going to be continual throughout your life. Jesus revealed that Peter would, would love him and not deny him. Instead, he would choose death over denial. And in that way, <laughs> he would, in a sense, redeem himself, you might say. He was going to give his life. When Jesus says, follow me, it's actually the present tense. Keep on following me. In other words, you're following me now. Keep on. Keep on following me. And that's his word to us. Love me with all of your heart, and then keep on. let that compel you to keep on following me. Trust God with your future. Don't worry about uh, what's going to happen to you. Trust God with your future. He's got it all worked out anyway. And then notice what Peter does. Verse 20, he turns around. He sees John behind him, sees John following, and uh, he sees him, verse 21, and he says to Jesus, well, what about him? <laughs> What about John? Uh, what shall this man do? I'm going to die. Is he going to have to die too? By the way, Peter, uh, John died, but he didn't die a martyr. As far as we know, he died of old age. But uh, everyone dies. But Jesus' answer is interesting. Verse 22. Peter, if I want him to live until I return, what's that to you? Keep on following me. That's the bottom line. And so he is correcting him. He's, he's saying, look, 
Don't worry about others. Don't worry about other believers. Well, they're not doing this. This didn't happen to them. Why? Don't worry about other people. Don't compare yourself with other of God's people either. That's a major distraction in so many Christian lives, and it shouldn't be. Simply focus on Jesus and focus on what matters, and that is loving Jesus and pleasing him. As a result of what Jesus said, a rumor got started. Verse 23, then this saying uh, went abroad among the brethren that this disciple, John, wouldn't die. Yet Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say he wouldn't die, but he said, if I tarry, uh, if he tarry till I come, what's that to you? It's not your business. It's not your business. And, uh, you know, this, I think, highlights an important thing, and that is that we should concentrate on hearing the Word of God accurately. I think sometimes we're very sloppy in the way that we even read God's Word and then end up understanding it. We, we, we want it to say what, what we want it to say, and so we hear it a certain way, and that's not what it means. And that's what happened here. They didn't hear God's word accurately because they didn't listen carefully. Listen carefully to the word of God. By the way, Jesus does say, hey, I'm coming back. He said that in John 14. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come again for you. And here in the last uh, chapter in this epilogue, he says, till I come. You know, the coming of the Lord for his people is imminent. By that, I mean it can happen at any moment. There's nothing that has to take place for Jesus to appear at this very moment. Which I think is something that ought to really motivate us to love Jesus like he asked Peter. He wants our love. He wants that love to be shown in serving him and not merely living for ourselves. And if you don't feel useful to the Lord, then what is it? Get right with the Lord or just believe the Lord. We really need to ask ourselves, am, am I investing my life to impact others for Jesus? You know, he tells Peter, Feed my lambs. Feed, tend, or take care of my sheep. Lead them to pasture. I want to say, I've been a pastor for many years, and sheep are not always lovable. Sheep are sometimes ornery. They can be stubborn. Sheep can hurt you. Sheep can bite you. Sheep can disgust you. Sheep can make you want to quit. And the only thing that will change that is that you are motivated by the love of Christ. That the love of Christ is what makes a shepherd, what makes a servant of the Lord do what he does or what she does. When Hudson Taylor, who was the director of what was then called the China Inland Mission, interviewed uh, candidates for the mission field with his board. On one occasion, he met with a group of applicants to determine their motivations for missionary work. And so he asked them the question, why do you wish to go as a foreign missionary? And uh, this particular one replied, well, I, I want to go because Christ has commanded us to go into all the world. He asked another one, and that person said, I want to go because millions are perishing without Christ. Others gave different answers. And then Hudson Taylor said this, and this is important. I want you to catch it. He said, all of these motives, however good, will fail you in times of testing and trial and tribulation and possible death. There is but only one motive that will sustain you in trial and testing, namely the love of Christ. 
Why would you be a missionary? The love of Christ compels me. That's the point. Why would you serve people that perhaps aren't even thankful, aren't even grateful, aren't appreciative, aren't listening, are resisting? Why would you do that? The love of Christ, Paul says, constrains me. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? What did he mean by more than these? The fish or fishing? Do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Do you love me more than you love the disciples, your, your friends? I think... And again, it doesn't really matter because the Bible doesn't answer the question, but my own personal opinion for whatever it's worth is he boasted that they would all deny him. But Peter said, I won't. And I think Jesus was saying, Peter, you think you love me still more than these guys love me? You all forsook me and fled. You're not better than anyone else. On the same level. We're made of the same stuff. And the only thing that holds us is the love of Christ. And he has made that love so real to us.